it is good to see all of you this morning. As I said last Sunday, I can still tell you're smiling. I can see it in your eyes. And to me, it's a great thing, it's a great joy, it's a great feeling to, to know that you're happy to be here. Uh, just for the sake of those that may be visiting with us, we're going to pick back up with our church history today. And I don't know how Danny did it, but I had this on black screens with white letters. He put it on here, it's reversed. But just to give you a little background, in case you haven't been keeping up with the series that we're doing on the church history, the church as we know it, and as we worship God, was established on the day of Pentecost. We have a record of that in Acts chapter 2. Throughout the pages of the New Testament, you have churches that were mentioned. Corinth, Ephesus, and places like that. You come to the book of Revelation, and you have the seven churches of Asia. Laodicea, Smyrna, Sardis, Thyatira, and so on. But that's the last inspired record that we have of any churches. You jump forward in secular history, in the timeline of the world, to about 300 to 335 depending on which historian you look at, and you have basically the founding of the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church decided you were going to be Catholic whether you liked it or not. We read and watch movies all the time about how brutal the Muslims were. And you read about the Crusades. Well, that was the Catholic Church going down with the sword to convert the Muslims in Jerusalem to Christianity. But it didn't just stop there. It went on up into the late 1300s, 1400s, and even around the 1400s. What we would call the dark to middle ages. Okay? So when we finished off the last time that we studied this, we were in Europe, the British Isles. And the Catholic Church had even gone into this part of the world with the sword, forcing people to become a Catholic Christian. Then in all of this, we have to understand that there is a remnant of God's people adhering to the New Testament teachings. God always promised His children that there would be a remnant. So when you look at the Roman Catholic Church going into the British Isles and, and that part of the world, they claimed they were the first to bring Christianity there. But when Jesus gave the commandment to go into all the world, the Christian was already there preaching the New Testament doctrine. We have record that Christianity, the true Christianity, had already been there hundreds of years before the Catholic Church got there. So when we left off, that's where we were at. We're going to jump forward now a few years to around 14, 15, 1600. And we're in America at this time. When we come to America, you have to remember that the Mayflower has set sail, the Pilgrims have landed in America, and now you come to roughly 1700. And it's not the Catholic Church that is trying to force Christianity upon people, their version of Christianity. Now as we've said in all of these lessons, throughout the years there have been efforts by men to restore to the New Testament Church. And here in America, that has not changed. It's been here and in other countries as well. And some of these efforts have been more successful than others. You remember we talked about in Europe, there were men like Martin Luther and Calvin who wanted to reform the Catholic Church. In America, they don't call it the Reformation, they call it the Restoration because they want to restore the church back to the New Testament principles. And as I've said throughout this series, our loyalty is not to any group of people. It's not to any paper, it's not to any men, but it is to Christ and His message that is preached. Now these men that have gone on before us, there are lessons that they have taught, lessons they have learned that have been passed down from one generation to the next. They learned a great many truths that bear to be repeated. Not because they learned them, but because these truths are what we find in the pages of God's Word. So when we come to America, the religion of the day is not Catholicism, but it is Presbyterianism. This is what it went into in places like Ireland, Scotland, Wales, and things like, uh, places of that nature. 
So, when we talk about Presbyterianism, Wikipedia has some pretty good definitions. It says Presbyterianism is a part of the Reformed tradition with Protestantism. Remember, Reformation, Europe, which traces its origins to Great Britain and particularly Scotland. We might include in that Ireland. The roots of Presbyterianism lie in the Reformation of the 16th century, the example of John Calvin's Republic of Geneva, excuse me, being particularly influential. Most Reformed churches trace their history back to Scotland are either Presbyterian or Congregationalist in their form of government. Presbyterian denominations that trace their heritage to the British Isles usually organize their church services uh, inspired by the principles in the Directory of Public Worship which was developed by the Westminster Assembly in the 1640s. So you see, the Presbyterian Church took control of religious, everything religious in the United States. But notice how they formed everything. By man's organization in, in the 1640s at the Westminster Assembly. So, let's come to America now. Beginning in the United States, in the early 19th century, denominationalism, the Presbyterianism, was divided. These men argued over everything. They could not come to any agreement on a lot of things. And denominationalism, denominations, uh, primarily the Presbyterian Church, uh, they would exclude each other from their communion. What we're about to take part in, they would say, well, now, if you're part of this belief over here, you're not. Uh -uh. They wouldn't have any fellowship with each other because of the divisions within their own denomination. And because of that, we have a thing called creeds that were written. You ever heard the word creed? You know what it is. A creed is where man looks at the Bible and says, this is good, but we need something else to go along with it. A creed is basically a set of guidelines or rules that a group of men have come up with in their religious body to say, these are what we're going to live by. And my question is, why would you need a creed when you already have a book that you need to live by? And that's an important question. The creeds were written to exclude or give the guideline on how they would exclude fellowship from all that did not abide in their particular division or doctrine. And only those in their particular denomination were allowed to share in communion. Now, at this time, there weren't a lot of preachers. A lot of the congregations did not have what would be what we would call a regular preacher, like Eastside has a regular preacher. So they would have men that would go around in what you might call circuit preaching. He would go one Sunday here, maybe Sunday night in the next town. Next week he'd go over here. And you might be lucky if you had a regular preacher one Sunday a month. That's the way it was at that time. So about that same time, there were several men who came to the same conclusion that this division in the Presbyterianism denomination was wrong. They, divide, they said that the state that divided Christianity was not God's plan for mankind. I have to agree. When brethren are, are, are divided over issues, then there is a problem. And that's where this series is going to take us and as we go further into it. And the way I want to finish up the series is looking at how far some of our brethren, in our quotes, have taken man's initiative or ideas and said, this is what the church is. And when we finish up this series, y'all seen the pickup truck now, commercial where the tailgate drops and it does all these things and everybody around goes, your jaw's going to drop. <laughs> when you see and hear of just how far some of our own brethren are taking the division in the church. So, in this time frame, there were several men that began to preach a restoration movement. The first one we're going to look at is a man by the name of Barton W. Stone. His date there of his life is 1772 to 1844. Again, his history is that he was an ordained Presbyterian preacher. 
He studied at this Westminster Confession of Faith back in Scotland. But as he studied, he began to have doubts as to what they were teaching. Did it was it actually true to what the Bible taught? That's a smart man. Thinks for himself. You see, that's the problem with a lot of denominations leading up to this point, and even today, denominationalism. The people are not taught to think for themselves. You take the Word of God and you study it and see what it says. I hesitate to say this since it's being recorded, but I'm going to say it anyway. I doubt that the person will ever watch this, but I'm still not going to call her name. I dated a little Baptist girl back in high school. You know what I'm talking about. I dated this little girl in high school. She was a good Baptist. Mom and Dad were good Baptist, and we were sitting on the floor in the living room one Christmas watching a Christmas show. In some commercial or show that we were watching, like I said, this has been a lot, a lot of years ago. Something came up about Christmas being the birth of Christ. And she made a comment, and I said, No, it ain't. Yes, it is. I said, No, it ain't. So we discussed back and forth, and finally she jumped up and went to the kitchen to her good Baptist mother, and she says, Mom, Jeff says Christmas is not the birth of Christ. Her mama said, he's right. There is such a problem in denominationalism today. They believe some of the truths being taught in the Word of God, but they are so wrapped up in their actual beliefs that they won't see, they want to apply the truth if you slap them upside the head. But my point is, she, this little girl that I dated, she was wrapped up in what the pastor said, what mom and daddy said, what they've always taught her, that she didn't study for herself. You need to study for yourself. Barton W. Stone studied for himself and come to the conclusion that the Presbyterian church was wrong. And he put efforts in his life to try to bring people back to restore the church back to the New Testament principles. He was a leader of what was called the Great Revival at Cane Ridge in 1801. Now, this number is going to blow your mind. Y'all, some of you older folks, no slam on you intended, but do you remember growing up and when a gospel meeting was had, the building would be packed? And you'd have to put extra chairs out around the side and in the back and down the middle. you remember those days? When Bart W. Stone held this meeting, there were 20 to 30,000 people that came. I can't begin to imagine preaching to that large of a number. But they came because of what he was preaching. Now, you might think, well, this is America, and it's a large place, and I, I, I'm pretty sure that was far away. No, Cane Ridge was actually a place just outside of Lexington, Kentucky, what's now called Paris, Kentucky. Close to home. And he preached, and he rejected Calvin's doctrine about a limited atonement and election. He, he denounced all of these things, and there were 20 to 30,000 people listening to him, him preach. But the people didn't completely understand what God had expected of them. And it's sad to say, but I kind of agree with that thought today. When I talk to people that are visiting or I go visit places and we get into Bible discussions, just a hunch in the back of my brain says, I don't think people are studying their Bible. I don't think people have a full knowledge of what God's Word says. And that, that leads to another problem. That's why we're so readily or gullible, might be another word, that we're going to take hook, line, and sinker whatever the preacher says whether he's teaching the truth or not. And we've got to study for ourselves. This stone movement grew throughout the state of Kentucky, and he began to publish what was called the Christian Messenger in 1826 to 1845, and he did this to popularize his message that he was trying to instill upon everybody that we need to restore the, the church back to the original New Testament pattern. I completely agree with that. We need to be preaching today the New Testament pattern and not 
whatever the wind is blowing today. But Stone, as all men do, died in Hannibal, Missouri, November the 9th, 18, in 1844. The next preacher that kind of come up and took his place was a man by the name of Thomas Campbell, 1763 to 1854. He also was an ordained Presbyterian preacher from Ireland. And he moved here to the United States in 1807 and had intentions of bringing his family to later. He was going to come, get himself established, send back and have his family come over later. And he deplored the divisions within the Presbyterian church. Again, I agree. When a church is divided, you've got all kinds of problems. I preached for a little country church one time for several months, and it was almost like you could look at the factions inside the church. You had this group over here, you had this group over here, and that group back there, and none of them agreed about anything that the church was supposed to be doing. None of them agreed. The church was divided. And Thomas Campbell pointed out that he deplored, he hated the fact that the church was divided. And when he invited all branches of the church to share in fellowship, to go back to preaching non-division, remember he was an ordained Presbyterian minister, they pulled his license to where he couldn't preach in the Presbyterian church. He saw the evil of creeds and the division that they called. So in 1808, he began to preach, and he preached a sermon based off 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 11. In that sermon, he preached, where the Bible speaks, we speak. Where the Bible is silent, we are silent. I say amen. That's what we ought to preach today. We ought to preach what the Bible gives us authority for. We ought to practice what the Bible gives us authority for, and nothing else. Amen. So here in, in this preaching that he did, this sermon that he did, there was a man in the audience by the name of Mr. Monroe. And he told Thomas Campbell, and remember this is Presbyterian, he says, if we adopt that as basis, then there is an end to infant baptism. You see, they're beginning to understand when the truth is preached, people begin to have a little light bulb go up and they go, huh, I see. He understood that if you practice what the Bible says, then you can't be doing all of this other stuff. Well, Thomas Alexander replied, of course. If infant baptism is not, be not found in the scriptures, we can have nothing to do with it. Again, Amen. If the Bible does not give us authority, then we leave it alone. We don't have anything to do with it. And we find this in a book by Earl West, Search for the Ancient Order. So it is recorded. It's not just me saying, well, now, Jeff, you, or somebody said, Jeff, you found that on the internet. Mm -hmm. no. It's recorded for posterity. So in 1809, Thomas again wrote what this they call a famous declaration and address. It was published in September, on September 7th, 1809, and in this address, his plan was simple. A simple plan, and that's what I beg for here. Simply follow the Word of God. A lot of people say, oh, it's too difficult to be a Christian. No, it's not. If you simply do what the Bible simply tells you to do, it's easy to follow the guidelines. And in this he said, in essentials unity, in non-essentials liberty, in all things charity. In all that we do as Christians, there should be love. That's what he means by charity. In the essentials, in the things that we're commanded to do, we must be unified. The pattern that we have in God's Word, there's no leeway. You must do what God tells you to do. But now, in the things that are non-essential, like Jesus said, go and make disciples, he didn't specify how. He didn't say, ride a horse, ride a donkey, ride a camel, ride a boat. He says, go. He leaves that up to you. So, in that, the non-essential part of that command, we have some liberties. We have some freedom. But you see here that the men of the day are trying to stress the simplistic truth of God's Word. Get back to the basics. Well, Thomas had a son by the name of Alexander Campbell who lived in 1788 to 1866. 
He was the one that Thomas was, had left in Ireland and was going to bring him over to America later. But in his preparation to come to America, there was a shipwreck which detained him from coming. It delayed his coming until a later time. So while he's still in Ireland, he decides he's going to use that time for prayer and meditation. Think, pray, study about the Word of God. And he decided to, to devote himself to preaching the gospel of Christ. Remember, he's a Presbyterian too. And he went to college in Ireland and came to America in 1809. Now, in this time, he had come to the same conclusions that his father had made in his declaration and address. And these conclusions are, is that infant baptism is wrong. Things that divide the church are wrong and need to be pushed out. So slowly the father and the son work themselves out of denominationalism. So, we flash forward a few years, 1812, and these two men, father and son, they come together in the preaching and study, and they conclude that infant baptism is wrong. And then on June the 12th, 1812, he, Alexander Campbell, and six other men were emerged for baptism in Buffalo Creek. And soon, the great number of the members of the Brush Run Church did the very same thing. Now remember, we're still in Kentucky, so all of this is taking place. And they're bringing people out of denominationalism to the truth. And this led to a separation from the Presbyterian Church. The Campbells could no longer be accepted as Presbyterians. Which led, again, led to another problem. Because Alexander led, this led him to join what was called the Redstone Baptist Association in 1812. So four years later, in 1816, Alexander Campbell preached a sermon called Sermon on the Law at the association meeting. Now remember, he joined himself to this church, but he's still trying to go back to the principles of New Testament teaching. And here he developed the idea that, they, that the Bible has two separate covenants. Two separate covenants. And he used two passages to prove this. One of them was Colossians 2, 14 through 17. Where, the, where Paul says, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. So let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbath, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is a Christ. Alexander read this and said, there's something different here. And he also looked at this passage in Ephesians 2, verses 14 through 16, for he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enemy, that is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two. Thus making peace that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting death, uh, putting to death the enemy. This created a problem for the Baptist to 